Okay, so the next topic I want to look at is regression. And so this is one of the areas that uh, in data science where, that you might be wanting to, to use for various uh, scenarios. So this is when you've, you've got some data and you're trying to uh, find, some out, find out about that data, properties about it, that then might let you use it to do things like prediction, for instance. So if I'm trying to predict tomorrow's weather or heaven forbid, predict a um, the winner of an election, not that that might be something that people hear about at this point in time, I'm not sure, or market predictions or house price predictions, what you might want to do is look at a whole bunch of data, what things might uh, impact weather forecasts. So uh, wind over the uh, nearby oceans, or sunspot activity, or, or, you know, there's a whole range of things that may or may not impact weather. And you can feed, you know, how much uh, greenhouse gas has been re released in the last week or something. You might want to grab lots and lots of data and then try to use that to predict is uh, what, what might be happening to either to, to the temperature over time or even just, you know, what is a cyclone likely to hit or, just what's going to be the temperature tomorrow. So if you're trying to do any of those things, you want to predict that stuff. So what do you do? You get a whole bunch of data and then you've got to analyze it. And some of it you might want to throw away, other stuff that you might want to um, re-manipulate to be in, in different forms. And eventually you want to come up with some sort of model. And then the model might allow you to do some predictions. So you might then feed in all the data that you've got and then say, well, what's tomorrow's weather going to be like? And then you'll get something back. And so that's what we're going to look at, what we might be doing. We'll look at a very specific example uh, shortly, but um, uh, that's the kind of thing. So what, what are some of the problems that you um, might have of doing this sort of thing? There's what, some of the problems you might have is underfitting or overfitting. You might have outliers. And we'll, we'll look at some outliers. You can see there is a red curve going through a bunch of blue dots. Now, depending on what this data represents, that might be a really good fit. Um, if I believe that uh, I want a straight line through that, it might, I might want to do what's called linear regression and get a straight line that uh, runs through all the dots that you, you see there as close to the dots as possible. But it may not be linear. It may be some sort of polynomial. It might be a normal distribution. There might be, um, it might be, uh, chunked some way in that parts of it are in one sort of pattern and parts of it in another sort of pattern and so on. So there's lots of different factors that might come out in, into uh, regression and it may not be linear, but I'm just going to pick linear as an example. We're going to look at what's involved in, in doing that. Now the, ex the example that um, I'm using is some house price data. Okay, this particular one uh, comes from Kaggle, which is a nice place to uh, to go and look at a whole bunch of different samples from. It's not, not the most perfect one for house price data, but it actually shows um, some interesting things. And it'll turn out that it's hard to predict house prices, but it, but it sh shows up some, some interesting things. Now, so that data is actually sitting in a, you can go to that uh, URL that's on here. Don't worry about copying it down. It'll be in the slide notes. You can come back to it. You can, re you can see it. It'll be in the repo. It's got the uh, all of this information as well. Um, so it's got this data and it's got um, a bunch of stats from uh, five years ago, just over five years ago, from a particular region in, in the US. And it's got a whole bunch of uh, different columns uh, about the house house uh, prices. So there's 20-odd 20, 20 thousand um, house prices that were collected over, over a um, year period in that region and all collated in this way with all the different columns that are there. Now, when you when you go and find data like this, sometimes some of the columns might be missing for some of the properties. Some of them, some, sometimes the data might not make sense. And so you might need to go and, and cleanse it and rework with it. Um, and then you want to try to analyze it. So let's have a look at um, 
first cab off the rank, what we we could go and read that as a as a file, and just try to parse uh, using string manipulation libraries, looking for commas, looking for numbers and things. And but it would be a lot of work. So here we're going to go use a uh, Apache Commons CSV library. There's a few different uh, CSV libraries. These are for reading comma separated values for in files, and we um, if you've save an Excel spreadsheet, you can save it in this sort of format. So someone's gone and saved the data. So that's the format the data's in. And this basically shows you that it's sort of, you know, a line or two to to uh, read that data in and start uh, working on it. What we're going to do is um, read the data in and then just put it into a, a, a thing that's going to chunk it into uh, columns. Into We're going to use an empirical distribution there. So we're basically going to chunk it into bins, uh, and we're going to look at how, how things lay in, the, in terms of um, uh, the information. And um, yep, we're going to just pull out of those bins the uh, the number of bedrooms. So um, if you see in in the middle of the slide, um, just above, I've oh I've got two two lines in grey in the top half of the slide. In between those, you can see I'm reading the bedrooms there. I'm reading it, it comes in as, a, as text information out of the CSV. I'm converting it to an integer, and then we're going to chunk it into bins. And then I'm just going to do a bar chart. I happen to be using a, a technology called GroovyFX, um, but there's a bunch of different ones, and we'll see a bunch of different ones. And if you go and run that, you'll you'll see the output like that. And what this is showing us is just the bedroom count. So it turns out most houses have two bedrooms in this sample. The next most common is three, and then some with one, some with four, and then a smattering of other ones. Okay, so that so we're exploring our data at this point. We might want to go and uh, so I'm, I'm again pulling another library out of Commons Math, and I'm just going to get the summary statistics. And here's going to print the mean, standard deviation, min and max, and so on. Um, and the sum of them and stuff like that. So, so again, I'm just doing bedrooms. Um, so the max is 33 bedrooms. That's probably some sort of um, palace of some kind, but we're, we're going to come back to that. Is, is it a palace? Um, but that's the kind of thing I might do by in this exploratory phase. I'm just looking at that data and saying, does it all make sense? Is there some way I can... Uh, Usefully analyze this data, and so doing things like the summary stats might be a very early rudimentary thing. Um, when I notice that there's houses with uh, greater than thirty bedrooms, I'm thinking, well, is that some sort of block of units, some sort of dormitory? Is it a student dormitory of some kind? I'm, I might want to explore a bit further, and so I can write again. It's just one line of code. To, I can say, tell me about all of the. So in, in four lines all up, including an import statement there, which is just a way to um, reference the libraries I'm using, I can pull out all the data for all of the uh, houses in that data set that have got more than 10 bedrooms. Okay. And that, so that's, that's, that's pulled it all out. And there's going to be some interesting stuff that's there, which we're going to see in a minute. Um, but it's even a bit hard to read there. Groovy lets you do things in this sort of scripting form if you want, or if you want to, you can use features that you'd find in an object-oriented language for um, making things in a form that is easy to get to. Once, so I, I do a bit of more, bit more work up front to create things that are. In, in in a domain of in, of interest to me, which might be houses, bedrooms, bathrooms. And once I do that little bit more work, I can then pull in that data, put it into this domain, and then it becomes easy to talk about. I can write programs that talk about houses and bedrooms and bathrooms rather than give me column four, give me a, a an array of doubles. I, I've got meaningful things to talk about things by. So Groovy lets me do either one or the other. Sometimes it's really simple just to have lists and maps and dictionaries and 
what have you, data frames. Other times I can actually go do a bit more work and uh, I've now got uh, things that I can talk about. I can have houses, I can have um, uh, agents that uh, rent out houses. I can have, you know, I can start building up a bunch of stuff that I'm interested in and then the code to, to use to manipulate those things uh, becomes very, very simple because it's got a rich set of nouns and verbs to use when I'm when I'm uh, doing those things. So in this particular case, I, I pull out, I do exactly the same as I did before, I'll pull out the stuff that's uh, got more than 10 bedrooms. I'm using a slightly fancier uh, library here that actually automatically converts those CSVs into my domain objects. So I'm pulling them in straight into a, a list of those domain objects. And now I print out the ones that are outliers which are the ones with more than 10 bedrooms. And I know now I, it's easier for me to pull out some information that I find uh, interesting. What we've got here is we've got a house with 33 bedrooms, but less than two bathrooms. So I've, I'm either gonna have very, very long queues when I'm, uh, after I've had my four cups of coffee in the morning, um, I'm, I'm with, along with the other 33 people that I'm, uh, all um, locked down with when we all go try to share the uh, 1.75 bathrooms, it's um, maybe not going to be a pretty site. Or maybe there's a typo here. Maybe this data um, is is wrong. So maybe someone type, meant to type in three bedrooms and they, they bumped the key twice and they put in 33. So it's up to a human to apply some intelligence here or you, you could use some uh, machine assistance, some artificial intelligence assistance or whatever, but a human can come along and say, well, I think 33 bedrooms with 1.75 bathrooms, it's an outlier that uh, probably represents a mistake. I am going to exclude that. Well, you might not, It's but it's a human can come along and uh, do things. And that's one of the things you want to do in this exploratory phase. And the, well, the Groovy is just going to make the code easy to decide wh whichever way you go to exclude them or not exclude them. It's going to be simple to find them, simple to exclude them, and, and we'll see examples of doing that. Okay, so here I'm going to now go and print out the um, bedroom count um, again, but get rid of the outliers, and I get a much nicer little curve here. The other one was was kind of stretched. Um, there's, a, there's a 33 on this graph. Uh, I don't know if you can see my cursor or, or not, but I'm moving the. It does appear to be there for me. So there's a little out, a single outlier way up here at 33, and the other one was at 11. So it's kind of squashed my graph up. If I go get rid of those outliers, I get a much more uh, useful graph. And so that's the kind of thing you want to be doing that in this phase. And it's just it's just a, a very small amount of uh, simple groovy code to do that sort of thing if you if if you wanted to do that. Um, and I can uh, remove the outliers. And instead of looking at bedrooms, I can look at other things like price. So I can exclude based on bedrooms, but then view price and things like that. And it's very simple to be able to, uh, the code that you use to write that's very, very simple. Okay, um, this is actually gonna use the Groovy's REPL, the Groovy shell, and it's gonna go and use a thing, uh, one of the thing called table saw, which is a data frame and uh, it's got some other uh, data science functionality there, regression and plotting and, and uh, so on for you. Um, so we, we're just going to use that. It's, it's just showing you the, um, don't worry about trying to digest all the stuff that's coming back here. It's just showing you that it's relatively simple to be typing stuff in, getting stuff back. Here we're looking for the outliers and told us um, information about the data that has come in. We've now got two less columns than we uh, we dropped the outliers. We've got two less columns. We can go and look at look at some of the information and we can draw some plots. And uh, if I was doing this live, it would then pop my browser up and you'd get a little graph that uh, looked like that. So you've got the code to do all of that in the repo. So you can um, go and do that. The What's in the Beaker X will be a, a slightly different uh, graphing package, It'll, but you'll, there'll be similar sorts of things happening in, in the Beaker X world, but the code to do that, that all that stuff you saw there is uh, in the repo. And th this is actually looking at that code. Um, and I'll just show you what bits of it are doing. Um, so you can, 
this this is what was getting typed in as well. So you can either have code in a script like this and then execute the whole script, or you can be typing it in one you know line at a time into something like the REPL there, the Groovy shell. So rows.shape and it tells me the shape and then show me the structure of my data frames. Okay, give me the summary of bedrooms. Show me the ones that were my outliers. Okay, drop those outliers, please. And then um, tell me how, tell me the shape of what's left. So it went from 21613. Two, We've gone to 212. So we, we just did the ones greater than 30. I decided to keep the 11 and throw away the 33. So um, that might be uh, what I decide as my the intelligence, human intelligence uh, applied to this particular problem. And uh, now summarize all that and print the graph out. And that's what you'll see. And you you when you when you've got the, that entire snippet of code in the repo, if you go and open the top level build.gradle when you're opening it up in IntelliJ or something like that. You can just go into that file, hit run or hit control shift F10 if you know your keystrokes and all that will run. You'll, the things that you were, the yellow bits that were popping up will be uh, coming out on the console and when it gets to that last line, your browser will pop up and that's what you'll see. So you can you can get, get achieve all that uh, just by hitting run in that script. And that's what you'll be doing. If you're doing things from the repo, from the script, that's what you'll be doing. If you're doing things in BeakerX, it's a slightly different looking graph that, that gets produced, but it's a similar sort of uh, steps that will be taking place. And um, if you want, you can be, um, so actually let me, let me, um, I had this all set up and then I went and changed windows. Let me just check if I've got, that should be the one. Let me get out of my slides temporarily. Let's come back in and share this one. Now, um, sorry that the font's pretty small there. Let's. So that's. Uh, this is code similar to what you saw before, but it's it's for this second example that uh, I showed you. So if, if I just go and run this one, we'll see all that stuff that we saw was uh, getting printed. And now if I stop sharing that and show you the other window, and I've got to get to the window I is not showing to share the window that's now um, oh, this will be interesting. I share my self. <laughs> okay, there's me. Uh, this is th these are the three things that um, uh, were the last three lines in that script was printing out three plots, and there was three different kinds of plots: there's bubble plots and a three D plot, and so on. So they're inter interactive uh, plots. They pop up in your browser. And uh, they're interactive. So if you, if you um, sort of jump in, um, want to have a look at bits of it, you can dive in and you can go and start looking at all the different houses and so on. And um, you can see there that you can, I've actually gone and done, one of, one of the columns was uh, whether it's a waterfront house or, a, or not. And I've done them in a different color. But otherwise, you can see I've got the number of bathrooms on one column. I've got square foot of living space. I've got a bath. Uh, do I have bedrooms and bathrooms? So let me, no, didn't put bedrooms on this one. Um, and I've got a thing called grade, which is actually um, a, a human applied quality rating that that uh, the state agents or whatever might give to properties. And so I've, I've got all of those things there and I can go and sort of go and work out which of those do I think are the, the most important ones. Okay, so stop sharing that one and come back to that one. Okay, so that was showing that they're, they're live. 
Um, if you're in Beaker X, you'll see the graph that looks like this, and the tables will look in this sort of format. So it'll it'll look like you're in a it's it's um, looks like you're in a mini document with stuff some stuff that looks like um, cells you can edit, and other stuff that looks like uh, displaying things. And um, that's what we're going to do. Okay, so um, so far we haven't looked at regression. We've been just looking at um, exploring our data, graphing various uh, you know price versus bathrooms is is the is the one that's on the screen. Um, we we haven't actually tried to do any uh, do a model yet. We've been cleaning our data. We've been exploring our data. We've been looking at it. We're now actually going to do the regression, which is what this this section is all about. So what we're trying to do now is actually come up with our predictor. And the uh, most common um, ordinary least squares regression algorithm. And remember what I said is don't assume it's necessarily linear. Maybe that curved graph we had before might have been the best one for this. Um, but for now, we'll assume, okay, well, let's, let's just see whether the, the straight line does fit or not. And what what the ordinary least squares algorithm does is it, is it looks, it tries to draw a straight line. So it's got a particular slope and a, a particular origin starting point through your curves. And it tries to minimize the distance away for that line is from all of your data points. So that they call it kind of called residual errors. And the algorithm uh, minimizes that automatically as, as part of uh, doing that. Okay, and I'm gonna come back to that algorithm in a minute. So the ordinary, uh, least squares regression algorithm is, is what we're doing here. And when, when I go and come back and talk about scaling this up, I'm going to, I'll come back to uh, that particular problem. Um, so how do we actually do that in, if I'm trying to do a little bit of groovy code or something like that? So again, if I was using Weaker or one of those tools, I, I could probably go and do linear regression without doing any coding. And that, that that's an option that you've got. Um, but I'm going to show you how you can do it with simple lines of code, and this this works out well if you if you're going to um, explore. Maybe I don't want uh, linear regression. I, I might want something a little bit more complex. I might want polynomial uh, regression or multiple regression. We'll see later on. Having it in code lets me easily uh, switch between them and run. I can run multiple of them and then compare which worked out best, and um, it can be a useful way to do all this sort of stuff. So I um so I'm, I'm running my simple regression. It's just a single class that I create and feed in all the data and ask it to go and um, um, uh, work out what to, to do with that data. And um, well, the bit that I haven't shown you. Um, is that. Um, I'm just comparing it against it, it itself, the whole data set in this one. Okay. Um, so normally what you would do is you, you would uh, split your data up into what's known as a sort of a training set and then a testing set. And um, what you would do is you'd build your model on one of those. And that's what this, most of the examples are going to show uh, later on. This one here doesn't, doesn't actually do that yet. Um, and uh, oh, okay. So this, ah, uh, yeah, yeah. Don't worry about. It. Yeah, we'll see, see. We'll see something coming up in the next slide that's going to go into some more details that I was going to try to explain here. Um, so we're going to come up with that. We're going to we're going to uh, just draw the the plot, and then we're going to draw the regression line through the plot. Now, what can be seen here is that the number of bedrooms turns out not to be a great predictor of price. So it turns out that if you've got a million dollar house, um, it probably isn't gonna have 10 bedrooms because that's probably gonna be a block of units or a dormitory or something that's a bit cheaper that's trying to do mass, fit, fitting a whole bunch of people in, might be students in, in a dormitory. So number of bedrooms turns out not to be a great predictor on price. You can't, so, what this linear regression model is trying to do is it's trying to say, well, here's what an average house might be that has one bedroom. 
And then here's some sort of weight that every time you add in another bedroom, the price is likely to jump up this much. That's what a linear model is going to try to do. So you, you have some sort of weighting on the number of uh, bedrooms. Turns out that's not a very good model, and we can actually do the stats on that, and we'll, we'll do that in a minute. But it turns out none of the things that we're looking at are particularly grand. And that's useful to know, um, and we'll try to do something better shortly. But it turns out this is a hard problem. It's hard to actually get a good prediction on um, on what the house price is going to be, even though there's lots of things that uh, factor into it. So some, if you've got a, a rich or posh suburb, the, ha the house prices in that suburb are more likely to be higher. Even factoring that in, there's nothing. There's nothing which um, be, turns out to be a really good predictor. If you've got a rundown house in a posh suburb still might be a very low thing, even if it's got big rooms or large numbers of rooms or whatever. So there's there's lots of variation, and that's what the data is telling us, and that's fine to know, and, and we can decide whether or not, uh, you know, we might decide that we don't want to put a lot of uh, um, confidence in the predictions that are going to come out of our models. But in, So in this case here, we're just doing linear regression on a, on a um, single variable in our, in our model. So I've got bedrooms, bathrooms, the square foot of living space, so, the, so how big the, the house is, and the grade, which was the the real estate agent's uh, predictor of, um, of the kind of quality of the house. And bad news is for grade there is that if, if you've got a grade between one and four, you're going to actually have to pay someone to take the house off your hands, unfortunately. So it's um, that that particular graph is um, not very good for the low ranges of grade. Not very good for the high ranges of grade either, but it's particularly bad for the low ranges of grade. And so this this is again what the reason you're doing this exploring is that um, you'll come and see this and you say that looks strange. Why why are house prices negative? And then you might say, well, let's not have confidence in the model below certain values or whatever. You might work out how to compartmentalize these. You might split your data up into two sets of data. Let's look at low grade and high grade houses separately and let's try to get different models for the two groups or whatever it might be. This is all part of the exploratory phase as the, the, the whole data science process. Okay, so this was what I was going to mention before. Here we're going to now chop the data. And again, it's really simple to chop data up into, into bits. Um, one, there's one line there that's doing the, the chopping. And uh, now we're going to run our, we're going to uh, train our model on the first half of the data, we, or first 80% of the data. And then we're going to use the other data to compare how well our models performed. And this lets us do some error regression type stats on, on what's happening here. Okay. And that goes and uh, works everything out. It's again a few few lines of code. We get, this time we're going to use uh, we're using JavaFX again, but we're just using a little table. Um, we'll see that it's a one liner to do tables in some of the other frameworks. But I was I was just sticking with the technology that did the graphs before for that one. Okay, so that's and what we we've, we've got here is some R squared and, and uh, um, root mean squared error uh, values here. If you've got an R squared, you, you want that to approach one. And uh, 0.49 is the best that we get here, which is the square foot of living. So what it's telling us is that none of these uh, features, certainly by themselves individually, are really good predictors, but some are particularly bad. So number of bedrooms it was, is just bad. And that's even after we've got rid of those outliers. So the 33 is gone, and it's still a very, very low uh, value there. So, so that's that's um, that's good to know, and we we could we might go and decide, or maybe I do need to split my data into partition it into different uh, groups. Maybe I do don't want to do linear. Maybe um, yeah, maybe there's uh, other information that I want to bring to bear here. And we can go and do things like um, print out the. The, those error values that we, we've got and compare it to a normal distribution. So all things being equal, if you've got a big number, a large amount of data and a very good model, you'd expect that the errors between the actuals and the predictions would follow a normal curve. So that's a, a statistician will give you the background into why that should be the case. 
we can actually print up what the things are. And, and you can see here that um, they look the, – the darker one is the what our areas are and the lighter one is what the what it's supposed to be. So ours are squished in a lot more, which means that there's they're getting a lot more errors in, in certain places. Basically, the outliers get really bad and the stuff in the middle is, is not too bad. But how do you how do you work out? Well, this isn't outliers in the sense of stuff that shouldn't be there, but the stuff that's uh, a fair. If it's if it's a long way away from your line, it's it's um it's going to be a bad predictor. That's good to know. So what we want to do is can we do better? And we can use multiple linear regression. And so this this is actually um, saying that, or perhaps if I look at not just any one feature by itself, but a combination of features, maybe I'll get a, uh, a better model of, of uh, how to do predictions. And so um, here I'm going to pick some of the features. So I think there was 19 or something features that were there. I'm going to pick about nine, uh, half of them. And I'm going to feed all of those in. And, and so where the linear model was saying, start at, you know, here's what a house with zero rooms or one room might be. And then for every uh, room that you add to the house, here's a weighted, you know, here's, here's how much you're going to add to the price. So I've got a weighting, if you like, on, on bedrooms. I have, I've got a weighting, if you like, on every single one of these features. So as I go from a, uh, a poor suburb to an affluent suburb, as I go from three bedrooms to four bedrooms, as I go from two bathrooms to three bathrooms, as I go from 100 square feet to 200 square feet, I'm going to weight all of those have a weighting all impacting the price and I'm going to find the best error of uh, you know tweaking those weightings and try to work out the best way to to do my predictions so if you if you remember that 3d 3d orange and blue blobs I'm, I'm looking now for a 3d line that's sort of feeding through the middle of all those blobs even with all of those weightings We'll look. We'll see the R squared in a minute, I think. Um, but it's it's much better, but it's still not a good predictor. So it turns out this is a hard problem to solve, right? But we've now got a, a much better predictor than we had with any single one feature, and it's slightly closer to a normal distribution. Still not fantastic. Okay, um, a few more slides on regression. Then I'm gonna I'm gonna break, and you're gonna play with either the 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 notebook one or the uh the code one for probably probably 10 to 15 minutes i'm just gonna let you play i'm gonna ask I'm gonna field questions and anyone who needs assistance you can i don't know if you can share your screens but we can certainly do video chat at least and you might be able to share what you're doing and what problems that you might be facing i can certainly run things myself and show you what it should look like for anyone who needs to see that but i'll give everyone a chance to try stuff out and at least read through the code and see what what you think might be happening and, and so on. Um, before we do that, just to, just going to quickly go through some other options. Did I need to do all of that coding? You could have done nearly everything with Weaker. So you can in Weaker you can go and load that data file up. You can go and print out all of the the columns that we said. So again, all this is without coding. These are all the the um, things it knows about. You can go and then prune down so it, it's actually we've gone and actually asked it of all of these features which are the ones that most impact uh, or, or are best at helping predict the price and it's come and ranked them all for us so we can go and say all right i'm just going to lop off the top six of those rankings please make that into a model for me now show me the r squareds and everything for that okay that we're, we're getting better now graph it all for me um they're the ones that I've picked. And I can go and ask it to generate a, a prediction model for me using those things. It'll go and work out the right weightings and I can go and ask it to graph it. And that's what it produces. And I can go save that model. And then I can actually use that from, from my code. I can use the weaker library to load that model and use that for prediction. Or I can reload it back into the weaker tool at a later point in time and and do some more stuff through the weaker tool. So I don't want to uh, deceive you that coding was the only way to get here. There's, there's, there's several ways to get here. And, but 
uh, coding has some nice advantages in that it's all the stuff that is there and it can be, you can use all of the the techniques you'd use with software engineering. You can have um, CI builds that run your models over data, over new data, over old data. Um, you can have, you can get, you can use testing frameworks that go and use property-based testing and other fancy techniques to um, generate data sets that are, are different to what you might have used when you were building stuff. And, and so you get more confidence by um, by having it in code, it opens up a whole lot of different uh, additional things that you can do. So keep that in mind. And just remember, we can, we can let me dive out into groovy scripting at any point in time for any, any of the, 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 the parts of the process. So I could have my um, cleansing steps diving out into Groovy, I could have my regression, I can rewrite my own regression algorithms in, in Groovy if, if I want. I can do the graphing in Groovy if I want, all, all inside Weaker as well. Okay. I'm going to do a couple of quick slides. It, that, that's all you need to know to do the labs. I'm just going to knock off and in fact, um, I might knock off um, both bits that I normally do. I've got a bonus section at the end. I'll talk about it now and we'll see how we, how we go. I'll just talk about it. We probably won't get time to, I'll come back to it, but, but I'll let you know that it's there and I'll tell you what it's about. Okay, so we're gonna do this regression now, but instead of having 20,000 house prices, we're gonna do all the house prices information that we've got in the whole of a country or something. How are we going to manage to do that? We might want to have a big a farm of uh, computing clusters of some kind of bunch of VMs, containers, whatever, running, all running stuff. Now, can I do that with this um, least squares algorithm? So what I'm trying to do is minimize the error across all my data. Now, if I go and run this across the whole country, all on different uh, clusters, different far, you know, computing farms, I might have each state's house prices all in different farms. How am I going to get some sort of stats that are going to be useful across all of that data? The thing is the ordinary least squares algorithm doesn't lend itself necessarily, and I'll come back to the necessarily, to working well in, in a in a big cluster because it's if I went and split if I if that's my graph and I went and split the left hand side into one of my put that on one one cluster and did the right hand side and put that on the other cluster I might get very different uh, gra lines being drawn there in fact I might end up with two sort of horizontal lines that don't even meet for going through the two different sets of data and if I've got a hundred sets of data I might have lines of all different angles uh, coming in um, from all my different things. And ordinary least squares is trying to minimize that. And each part of that can only partially minimize it because they've only got part of the data. So I've got suboptimal um, calculations going on in my, in, my, in my cluster. Turns out there are variants of the algorithm, gradient descent variants and other things that are much more amenable to being put into the sort of a clustering thing. So they, 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 uh, they're algorithms that work towards a, an answer in an iterative process. And they are much, much better at uh, being scaled up in this way. And as you might expect, people have, uh, who are trying to scale this sort of stuff up are quite aware of these sorts of algorithms. And that's in fact, exactly what is built into your Sparks and then your Ignites in their machine learning, in their data science libraries, if you like. Um, so in fact, there is a least squares regression trainer as part of the Ignite machine learning library that do it doesn't use the ordinary least squares algorithm that we use. In our simple case, it actually uses the gradient descent one that I that I tell you about. And it'll go and run it across a big cluster and automatically um, uh, iterate across the different clusters and uh, it'll permeate down to your answer. So if you want to scale this up, there is good options and the weaker won't let you do this very easily. 
it does let you do this if you dive out into Groovy code. Um, but the fact that you've gone and used Groovy code, you can swap out the the dumb linear regression one, plug in this fancier one uh, with not much effort. Now, it turns out for Ignite or for Spark, there's a bit of effort in sort of plugging into those frameworks because you've got to sort of boot, boot up my cluster, boot up my farm, um, f or find it or whatever you might need to do. Sometimes they're using very slightly different data frame technologies. They may not be. If you're on Spark, you can use their, their data frame technology inside or outside the Spark framework. So you might not have any, they, there might not be a, a huge gap, but you can easily scale these things up. So there's the code for, for uh, Ignite. You won't see that if you're trying to run the Beaker X stuff because you need to have Ignite uh, available and running on your machine. And it's, it's sort of too much to put into one of those um, notebooks. Um, but it, you'll see that it does the job there. Spark's the same story, same sort of code that we're setting things up. We're using the Spark's data set uh, libraries here. <clears throat> Otherwise, the stuff that we're doing is very, very similar to all the other ones. Um, now, I'm going to mention two other bonus sections at the end of the the uh, the repo that we won't get time. They're in the slide deck, and they're in the repo, but we won't really get time to to uh, go into them. But I'm going to tell you about them now. It's it's um, bonus material. You're all been patiently uh, listening to me talk for quite a while now, so I'll give you this bonus material, and then we're going to get you doing uh, some hands-on stuff. Okay, I said that uh, ordinary least squares doesn't lend itself to being put in a cluster. And that's true to some extent, but it turns out that if you do a, a um, if you've got a large enough data set and you do a large enough number of customers, the fact that you've actually got a whole bunch of slightly different curved lines uh, doesn't matter so much. What you do is you go and work out all those on the cluster and then you use the cluster to permeate all your answers and you average out all the different curves and you eventually you get the average of all your curves. And if your data set's big enough, um, that uh, that process, which doesn't use a specialized, just uses plain old linear regression and then just averages them all out, ends up giving you fairly reasonable results. So in the, in the uh, repo, there is using a, a Apache Beam, and there's using Jeepers, the, the parallel library, to split this data up, split it out onto a cluster using those technologies um, that I'm telling you about, gets the answer back, and it comes out with pretty reasonable uh, results. Now, what I'm going to do, I said I wasn't going to go through the slides, but I'll just, um, I'll just very, very quickly... So there's the one which I said was um, you can't scale this up because you need to minimize the fit. Well, you kind of can. And what you do is you do, it, you do it in chunks and then you aggregate the chunk. And basically, for your, if you're trying to visualize what's happening here, you, you, you've got a whole bunch of lines that are all very slightly different angles. You're just averaging them all out. And then once you've got that model, you're pre predicting using that model is, is inherently um parallelizable so so the the um training your model is not perfectly parallelizable but here we here's we can tweak tweak things slightly and make it work and we get what turns out that the, what you get is actually very very close to what the smarter algorithms are going to give you anyway and once you've got that model then your prediction process actually is uh fully parallelizable and so that's the process that you can use, and you can use Jeepers or use uh, Beam to do that. Here's the code for Jeepers. It's it's very simple to do. That's just telling you what the different bits of it are doing, showing you that it works, telling you about the different bits there. Same thing with Beam, showing you how to do the bits and pieces. And um, this is using, you know how I said Beam, you can plug in different things underneath it. You can plug in Spark, you can plug in one. It also has just an in-memory one, and that's all I used for this one. But you can plug in other things underneath Beam. So this would allow you to go and use this bit of code and run it on a whole bunch of different uh, farms, if you like, different uh, stacks. 
data science stacks underneath you and, and get your results. And the code wouldn't need to change across all those stacks. You'd just reconfigure how they're, they're structured. So, that, so that's all nice. Um, I said Groovy was extensible. Turns out I can do just these four lines of uh, Groovy metaprogramming that are uh, down in the sort of bottom third of the of the slide there. If I do those four lines, then in fact, my top half, instead of looking like on the previous slide like this, which is sort of looks a bit like Java code, but slightly simpler, I can make it look like Python code, very, very close to Python code, as simple as the Python code anyhow, very slightly different. Um, by just doing a few little tricks here. And that's using a tiny, tiny uh, taste of Groovy's DSL capabilities. So there's, there's some bonus things. You've got all the code for both of those. You can go and run that in the repo if you want. It doesn't go, come in the notebooks. Okay, so let me jump back to... Uh, somewhere around here. Clustering will be our second section. Our second section. We'll start that in uh, fifteen or twenty minutes. So what I want you to do now is some hands-on. Either want you to go and if you've got the repo, if you've downloaded it already, pull up some some of the code that, that I went through in your browser and just try running running the scripts. If you if you're confident with the code, try tweaking things. Maybe try splitting your data up into high-priced houses, you know, premium houses and uh, less premium houses and then do the graph for both halves or something. See, or see if your R squared values get better for the two halves, um, if, you, if you're familiar with coding. Otherwise, just run it, see if you can try to understand what's going on. If you're in the BeakerX environment, you'll have the same thing. You'll be able to do little tweaks to the, to the code as well and then re, rerun all your cells. So do go do that. We'll, 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 um, I'll, I'll break for just a couple of minutes myself. Um, I'll, I'll be back very shortly. I'm going to help anyone who's got questions. Then we're going to do what we did with the regression. We're going to do the same thing with clustering and, and whiskey. And then I'll probably do deep learning with pictures of uh, dogs and bicycles and things as um, another example. Uh, there, there is some natural language processing stuff as well, but I'll probably just do the, um, the deep learning one. And... Uh, that will probably round us out to uh, the, how this session is going, but we'll see how we go. So right now we're going to do um, re regression. Go and look at, so I want you to do a bit of hands-on stuff so that you, you're awake when we get to clustering. Um, run either the stuff on the, the notebooks on the GitHub site. You can run that from your browser or play with it in your IDE. Okay, and we'll, we'll, we'll start the, um, the discussions uh, again shortly.